Okay, welcome to today's episode of the Jason Modar Show. Glad to have you all here. Currently enjoying a nice cup of hot tea, spiced chai with milk and way too much honey. Because milk and way too much honey is the only way to enjoy a cup of tea. So for today's episode, I'm going to be discussing some goings-on in the Southern Baptist Convention and as it relates to lady pastors. But before doing that, I want to get into some of the books that I am currently reading. I won't spend too much time on this. One of them is Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. Almost halfway through it. Doesn't quite look like being halfway through it for those of you looking on the screen, but a good chunk of this book in the back is the appendix. As many of you know going through a book study. A gentleman at church is leading a group of us, about a dozen or so, through a book study on the three Lord of the Rings books. And we're on Return of the King about halfway through, or at least we need to be halfway through by Monday when we meet again. I just finished a chapter on the Houses of Healing, and it's a chapter where Aragorn heals and saves Mary, Eowyn, and Faramir from certain death Faramir from being pierced by a dart from the enemy, and then Eowyn and Mary nearly dying because of them attacking and killing the Witch King Angmar during the Battle of Pelennor Fields. And then also in that chapter, Aragorn goes throughout the rest of the city of Gondor, healing people who have been hurt during the Siege of Gondor and the aforementioned Battle of Pelennor Fields. So when I finish reading Return of the King, it'll be my third time through the trilogy, and I highly recommend reading it if you haven't yet, although be warned, if you read the trilogy and all you know of it is the movies, it's going to ruin the movies for you. The movies just pale in comparison to the book. You're going to read the books, realize how superior they are to the movie, and be irritated at Peter Jackson for his interpretation of the trilogy and Tolkien's writing. And the other book I'm reading is a book I actually started many, many months ago and then got distracted with other books, Postmodern Times, A Christian Guide to Contemporary Culture and Thought by Gene Edward Veith. And like the subtitle suggests, it is a Christian guide to contemporary thought and culture as it relates to postmodernity and postmodernism. Veith does a good job of explaining from a Christian perspective what postmodernism is and does a good job of explaining how a Christian ought to analyze and think about and react to postmodernity. So, currently sinking my teeth into both of those books, but let's get into the content for today, shall we? So, Southern Baptists held their annual convention in New Orleans, Louisiana from June 13th to 14th. And among the highlights was the passing of the Law Amendment. The amendment passed with the necessary two-thirds majority, and according to an article written by J.D. Greer, the article that is going to be at the center of today's episode, the amendment specifies that churches would only be in friendly cooperation, friendly cooperation with the Southern Baptist Convention, if they appoint, affirm, or employ only men as a pastor of any kind. And to that I say yes and amen. The amendment takes effect only if it passes by another two-thirds majority vote at next year's Southern Baptist Convention, which is to be held in Indianapolis, Indiana. So in addition to the passing of the law amendment, so named because of the pastor, Mike Law, who introduced the amendment, in addition to this, more good news for Southern Baptist, Saddleback Church was disfellowshipped from the SBC due to its wholesale embrace of egalitarianism. Uh, the church is pastored by none other than Rick Warren, or I think used to be pastored by none other than Rick Warren. He obviously still has a lot of clout and influence at that church. So the church was pastored by Rick Warren and some women, but I repeat myself. And Warren and company refused to repent of their unbiblical position when it comes to female pastors and female elders. And the SBC did the right thing by kicking Saddleback, and I believe one other church as well, out of cooperation with the convention for embracing egalitarianism and refusing to follow the 
Constitution, Baptist Faith and Message, and the Bible as it relates to female pastors and elders. So that went down. But then there was this article. This article right here. Thousands of black churches could face Southern Baptist Convention expulsion over women pastors. That's right. Thousands of black churches could face th Southern Baptist Convention expulsion over women pastors. Bans, expulsions have created division. SBC African American Fellowship head warns. So just when the SBC was in the driver's seat, this happens. Now, different versions of this article appeared in multiple different outlets. I'm not going to read the article in its entirety, but I'm going to read a good chunk of it just so you can understand some needed context before we specifically dig into the Greer article. So again, Southern Baptist passed the law amendment, which is a firm, biblical, and straightforward amendment to their constitution as it regards female pastors and elders, and then this hits multiple news outlets across the nation, this article. So let me go ahead and read it for you. As many as 4,000 black churches with women pastors could be kicked out of the Southern Baptist Convention under the denomination's new rules, warns the Reverend Gregory Perkins. Mr. Perkins, president of the SBC's National African American Fellowship, said in a new letter to the head of the SBC, that the denomination's ruling against women pastors has created divisions within the SBC and may disproportionately impact NAAF-affiliated congregations. With over 47,000 Southern Baptist churches in the United States, the loss of 4,000 black congregations could cost the denomination around 9% of its membership. Mr. Perkins asks in the letter for a meeting with SBC President Reverend Bart Barber. If approved, Mr. Perkins warned, if the amendment was approved, Mr. Perkins warned the change may signal that churches that give the pastor title to women are no longer welcome in the denomination. The issue of women in the ministry has become a flashpoint within the nation's largest Protestant denomination. The removal of any SBC congregation over the issue of a woman holding the title of pastor would require individual action for each church, said Doug Weaver, chair of the religion department at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. If they actually implement what they passed a few weeks ago in New Orleans, they would have to bring up all those churches individually by name and ask them to be excluded, Doug said in a telephone interview, based on what they did Last few weeks ago, that is certainly possible. Mr. Weaver said some congregations might change a person's title from pastor to minister to remain in compliance, but others that don't have a problem with the pastoral designation could end up with a situation that some of the leaders didn't anticipate. There are some people that are just interested in purity regardless of the costs, so wait and see who's really in charge, he said. Mr. Perkins wrote in his letter, Many of our churches assign the title pastor to women who oversee ministries of the church under the authority of a male senior pastor, i.e. children's pastor, worship pastor, discipleship pastor, etc. Mr. Perkins said the decision by a congregation on who to hire as staff and their titles is an independent determination based upon a local church governance decision and thus should not be grounds for expelling a church from the SBC. The autonomy of the local church is a defining Baptist conviction and forms the foundational framework for our shared cooperation, he wrote. In a separate document, the NAAF says it believes the decision to appoint or employ a woman with a pastoral title is not a national governance matter and should be decided by the local church. Mr. Perkins asked Mr. Barber for a meeting to discuss the matter. In a message shared with the Washington Times, Mr. Barber says he looks forward to working with the Black Caucus. It's not only black churches in the SBC pushing back against the denomination's new direction. <clears throat> the Reverend Rick Warren, founder and retired senior pastor at Saddleback Church, blasted the denomination as the shrinking Baptist convention for its restrictions and posted a response to the June actions at sbcstand.com where supporters can register their agreement. So that's the article, and again, the purpose of this article was to provide context for the Greer article. 
And there are many things in that Washington Times article worth responding to and analyzing, but much of those items will end up being addressed in the Greer article. So the SBC passes the law amendment, kicks out churches like Saddleback Church, and then this article hits. They get a letter written to them from the National African American Fellowship, a coalition of black churches within the SBC who are concerned with the contents of the law amendment. And now the question is, will the SBC cave to the pressure and the PR hit of potentially disfellowshipping 4,000 black churches? Because there is nothing that terrifies soft evangelical Christians more than being called a racist. So what's the response going to be? What is the SBC going to do? How long will it take until somebody, some sort of elite within the SBC, responds in some sort of placating manner, admonishing, exhorting, pleading with the SBC to slow down on the law amendment and consider the ramifications of it? Well, to answer that question, enter J.D. Greer. So J.D. Greer ended up penning a, an article on his blog titled, A Time to Come Together, The Unintended Effects of the Law Amendment, as for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, see on your screen right now. So I'm not going to read the entirety of this 3,000 word article, but Greer's response was predictable, meaning that it is no surprise whatsoever that somebody like J.D. Greer would come to the rescue and attempt to give some sort of a winsome and nuanced rebuke of the law amendment. It was only a matter of time before a big name squish like J.D. Greer did something like that. One wonders, though, if Greer would have taken mere days to respond to the controversy if the churches in question were predominantly white. I guess we'll never know, because the churches in question are predominantly black. So I'm going to dive into certain sections of this article rather than going through the article in its entirety. Again, it's a very lengthy post that Mr. Greer wrote, over 3,000 words, and I don't need to read all of it for y'all to get a sense of Greer's line of argumentation. So let's go ahead and begin going through this article. So I, I want to begin by giving an attaboy to J.D. Greer because he's not going to get many from me during this episode. But one thing I do want to say is that I want to compliment him because not everything in this article is one giant capitulation to blacks and to women. So at the beginning, as I have highlighted here, so for those of you following along, I'll attempt to highlight each section as I'm reading through it but I'll also read it out loud as well. <clears throat> so towards the beginning of the article, Greer writes, many Southern Baptists voted for the law amendment because they rightfully believe the office of pastor is limited to men and wanted an opportunity to affirm that, especially after hearing disheartening examples of a few prominent evangelical voices who regard complementarianism to be backward, archaic, and misogynistic. So right off the bat, good on Greer for saying that believing the office of pastor to be limited to men is a right belief, because it is. First Timothy 2 and 3 and Titus 1 make it clear that the office of pastor, and I'm going to use pastor and elder synonymously because a pastor is an elder, or that's how a pastor should be viewed. So this would be the office of pastor slash elder. They're limited to men. There's a specific set of requirements for the office of elder, and one of those requirements is to be a male. Then there's also passages like 1 Timothy 2, where it's clear that women are not given the authority to teach men or to exercise authority over men, which would mean that as we, the church, the bride of Christ, a female entity, submit to our husband, Jesus, a male, that Part of our submission to our head, Jesus, involves our local congregations submitting to what the scriptures have to say about who is in leadership in our churches, and that's men. So good on Greer for affirming that. And then as for 
evangelicals who regard complementarianism to be backward, archaic, and misogynistic, they need to be rebuked and exposed as the lovers of the world that they are. So the SBC did this at the Southern Baptist Convention, for instance, with Rick Warren. Instead of holding to scriptural fidelity, churches like Saddleback have just gone with the winds of culture. However the winds of culture shift, they shift right along with them. However the waves of culture move, they're going to move right along with those waves. They're like what James articulates in James chapter 1. They are a double-minded man who is easily swayed and tossed about like the waves of the sea. I will say this, though. Complementarianism, I'm not a, a fan nor a proponent of complementarianism, but of patriarchy. Complementarianism is a weak substitute for a fuller biblical theology of gender roles, that being patriarchy. Patriarchy simply meaning father rule. Fathers rule in the home, fathers rule in the church, and fathers ought to rule in the civil sphere as well. Civilization is built by men with families to feed, and the biblical model is men in leadership. And everybody likes to rush and point to people in the scriptures like Deborah. Oh, well, what about Deborah? Well, Deborah is emblematic of a lack of quality male leadership in Israel during that time. Deborah was chosen to be a judge and to be the ruler of Israel and to be the rescuer at that time of Israel because men like her general, Barak, refused to even go into battle unless a woman went with him. So there was clearly a problem with male leadership in Israel at that time, and Deborah was righteous and did her job, but God also used her to shame the men of Israel. And I'll say this before moving on. Greer calls these evangelicals who regard complementarianism as backward, archaic, and misogynistic, and they would certainly feel that way about patriarchy. He calls them disheartening examples. That's weak. They are way more than disheartening examples. They are wolves. They are deniers of the truth. Many of them are lovers of evil and lovers of this world and refuse to do what the scriptures have to say when the culture is saying the opposite. All right, so let's move on in the article. So here is all right, next paragraph here. So while supportive of the desire to affirm complementarianism, I want to suggest that this amendment is not the way to do that and that it will have deleterious effects far beyond what most Southern Baptists intend, as evidenced by this open letter by our National African American Fellowship, who are pleading with us to slow down and consider the implications of what we're doing. So I read that letter. I read the letter from the NAAF. Allow me to go ahead and summarize it, and I will put a link in the description box to it and to the Greer article and to the Washington Times article so you can read all of this for yourself and vet me and make sure that I'm summarizing this correctly. So allow me to summarize the letter from the NAAF to the SBC. We, the black SBC churches, are worried that the law amendment signals to us that since we allow women to serve as pastors, or we call them pastors, we aren't welcome in the SBC. You should respect our local church autonomy and keep unity with regards to secondary issues like us calling women pastors. This amendment may disproportionately affect the 4,000 black churches in the SBC. We also have faith in Jesus, a firm scriptural authority, and champion the Great Commission. Let us pray and dialogue about the law amendment. And that's really a good approximation of what that letter included. Again, you can read it for yourself. It's about a page, page and a half long. Well, I have a few things to say about that. Number one, if your female employees are not functioning as pastors, that's great. They should not be functioning as pastors. They should not be fulfilling the duty, the role, the obligations of pastors or elders because they're not elders. That's great. However, stop calling them pastors. It's unbiblical and it's confusing. That's what's going on with some of these churches. J.D. Greer in this article talks about a nomenclature problem. This is just a nomenclature problem. You just have churches that are complementarian in their theology, but they're just they're calling their women pastors, but they're not actually functioning as pastors. Then don't call them pastors. And don't call them elders, because they're not. It's unbiblical for you to call a woman a pastor or an elder because that's not a role that they ought to hold. It's similar to the homosexual issue. 
homosexual marriage. I like what Doug Wilson and others have to say about this. It's a mirage. The state can go ahead and attempt to redefine marriage, but there is no biblical category for a homosexual marriage. There is no biblical category for a homosexual union and covenant before God and man. It doesn't exist. So their marriages are mirages. They're not actually really married. Likewise, there's no biblical office of elder or pastor for a woman. So women who call themselves elders and pastors, they're not really elders or pastors. They're just in rebellion against God, and they're attempting to fill a role that doesn't actually exist for them to fill. It's a role that only is for men to fill. It's also confusing. It's confusing to members of the church's congregation. It's confusing to other Christians who know of the church. It could be confusing to outsiders about what actually constitutes a pastor. So if she is not fulfilling pastoral duties, that's great. But also don't call her a pastor or an elder because she is not. And calling her a minister instead, we know what that means. It's the same idea. And then part of the letter talks about disproport the amendment disproportionately affecting 4,000 black churches because these 4,000 black churches, at least some of them, either employ women and call them pastors or employ women who are not only called pastors but fulfilling pastoral duties. Well, to that I say, who cares? Who cares if the implementation of the amendment disproportionately affects 4,000 black churches, 4,000 white churches, 4,000 Korean churches, 4,000 Eskimo churches? It doesn't matter. The amendment is in lockstep with the Word of God. So, bow your knee to the Word of God and stop bowing your, near, your knee to the fear of being labeled a racist. It doesn't matter if it affects mostly black churches. If those black churches refuse to comply with the amendment and continue an unbiblical practice, then they gots to go. Either this, either the Word of God is the authority, it's the standard, it's over you, or something else is over you fear of women, fear of minorities, fear of whatever is over you. So stop bowing the knee to that and instead practice courageous fidelity to the word of God. And then they also mentioned that they believe in the authority of scripture. Well, if they did believe in the authority of scripture like they mentioned in this letter, then the NAAF churches would not have women pastors, nor would they call their female staff pastors. If scripture has authority, then scripture makes it clear that women are not to be pastors slash elders. So they would not have pastoral or elder duties, nor would they be called pastors or elders. And as for the end of it, calling to pray and to dialogue, there's no need to pray and dialogue. Pray that it passes next year, the amendment, yes, but there's no need to pray and further dialogue. The amendment's fine. It should be implemented as is. Pass the law amendment at next year's convention and stand firm on the truth of God's word and not on the sinking sand foundation of coddling the feelings of offended blacks and offended women. All right. Let's go on in the article. Let me get to the next paragraph I want to highlight. All right, this one right here. All right, so Greer writes, I do oppose this amendment because it binds the hands of the Credentials Committee from differentiating between those churches who have committed, to use Al Mohler's words, a grievous error, in this case, rejecting complementarianism, and those who I believe simply have a nomenclature problem. Since the conservative resurgence, we have sought to be united on primary things, e.g. salvation by faith alone, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the inerrancy of the Bible, etc., and secondary things also, e.g. complementarianism, believer's baptism, regenerate church membership, etc., this amendment, however, makes conformity on a tertiary thing, right nomenclature of an office, a standard for fellowship. It's not tertiary, though. Names matter. Titles matter. Confusion abounds when you take a postmodern approach to language. So, within the framework, the ideological framework of postmodernism, is this idea that truth is subjective that there is no objective truth, and that anybody who asserts objective truth is asserting a power play. It is an oppressor attempting to assert domination and power over an oppressed person if they attempt to take some sort of objective stand. And the same thing applies to language in the postmodern mind. Words and titles, and we, we and, I, and I mean we, 
and I mean me when I say we, we are so infected by postmodernism and postmodern thinking we don't even realize it. Uh, on the daily, I am having to rid myself of postmodern notions, which is why you should read books like this one so you can understand postmodernism and just how much it permeates and pervades our culture. The whole idea of you do you, that's fine if you want to do that, it's not for me, but it's for you, that's completely rooted in postmodernism. So I don't know if Greer realizes just how saturated his thought process is in postmodernism. Words and titles just don't get to mean whatever one wants them to mean. And that has to be true of what the Bible says, where the Bible is just this subjective thing that can mean whatever we want it to mean to whatever, to whoever, and to whatever circumstance that we want to. It's not tertiary. This is a secondary issue that should be treated as such by the SBC, and this should not be allowed. You should not allow churches to call women pastors or elders, nor should you allow them to function as pastors or elders, whether or not they're called as such. All right, let's get back to the article. So Greer goes on to claim that the SBC has a history of ecclesiastical confusion and that this is supposed to buttress his argument that the SBC should slow down with the law amendment. So let me find the section here. So it's this paragraph right here is the next one. All right. So, as an example, Greer says, many Southern Baptist churches hire a seminary student to serve as their youth pastor. These candidates are often unordained and remain so for several years. If we count the number of unordained youth pastors serving in Southern Baptist churches that are not thought of as elders in those churches, I'm guessing that number would be in the thousands. This error, as it has effectively separated the office of pastor from that of elder. But is it a disfellowshipable one? You may be asked what relevance these examples have to the question of whether complementarian churches with the woman on staff call they call pastor can still be considered in friendly cooperation. It is this. If we are willing to remove a church that is clearly complementarian for wrongly calling someone a pastor who is not a 1 Timothy 2-3 to elder, wouldn't consistency demand that we remove all these other churches too? So, quick side note. Uh, seminary students, likely to be in their early to mid-20s, should not be youth pastors. Older men, who meet the standards of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, ought to be pastors slash elders, including youth pastors. So you think about some of the requirements. It should be the husband of one wife, meaning that, depending on your interpretation, if you're an elder or a pastor, including a youth pastor, that you should be married and that he should have an orderly home, which means that he should also have, potentially some argue that he should also have children. Either way you shake it out, this should be a man of mature faith who has demonstrated his maturity over a number of areas across the guidelines as handed down to us by God through Paul in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Teenage boys and girls need mature men with wives and families, potentially, discipling them, not seminary students barely older than the teens themselves. All right, but that was just a digression, digression over. So if this is an error, as J.D. Greer is, is claiming that this youth, youth pastor thing, and then also somehow the law, then this show demonstrates that the law amendment's an error as well, because we have in the SBC, according to Greer, sloppy ecclesiology. If this is an error, if this is sloppy ecclesiology, then fix the error clean up your house, SBC. Quit separating elders from pastors. Clean up what's going on. This is your bed. Now you have to lie in it. So make your bed. Fix what's going on. As for disfellowshipping these churches with youth pastors that aren't ordained elders, as Greer claims that you would have to do if you wanted to be consistent with what the law amendment asks, this it's apples and oranges to compare this lady pastor issue to the youth pastor issue, since there is no equivalent law amendment for this situation. The SBC doesn't have any amendment or any part of their constitution that requires the vetting of youth pastors and the cleaning up of this error that was made. But they do have one for the law amendment, and the law amendment is biblical. It's not, it's not the same 
kind of thing that's going on because there's no equivalent law amendment for the situation. And with the lady pastor issue, it is crystal clear in the scriptures that women ought not hold the title of pastor or elder, nor should they be functioning as one. All right, so let's move on in the article. Let me find where I'm supposed to be here. Here it is. All right, so with this amendment, Greer writes, if a church is brought to the credentials committee that has any woman on staff who is a pastor of any kind, such as a woman who oversees their children's ministry or website development, the Constitution mandates that the committee recommend disfellowship. They are, by constitutional declaration, not in friendly cooperation. No exceptions. Even if we discern they are, indeed, complementarian, and this is merely and this is merely inaccurate titling of someone's staff position. So his claim here is that there are no exceptions to this, that if you find somebody with even a low nomenclature issue, issue, just boom, no exceptions, they're out. They're disfellowship, we kick them out right away. This isn't true. That's actually not true. There are exceptions to this. The process isn't that harsh in terms of discipline for churches that are found to have either women with pastoral titles and or women who are fulfilling the duties and responsibilities of a pastor or elder. He's making this seem harsher than it is when just a few paragraphs later in his own article, here it is, just a few paragraphs later, here's what he writes. I've heard the response, well, before we disfellowship them, we would give them a chance to change their views and adjust their practices. Of course we would. We'd also do that for racist or LGBTQ plus affirming churches. Hopefully when we explain that the best reading of the New Testament points to pastor being synonymous with elder, they will change their titles accordingly. Exactly. Telling or tell the offending church to change the duties, responsibilities, and job descriptions of women who are serving in pastoral roles, regardless of the actual job title. And if they have a woman operating under the title of pastor, but she does not perform any pastoral or elder duties, that's a good thing, but you still need to change her title. It's, there, there are exceptions. It's not as cut and dry. It's not as harsh as J.D. Greer would want you to believe. But it actually is, it's very simple. If you find a church that has a woman functioning as a pastor slash elder, Tell them to knock it off and change that. Do something about it. Or if she has the title but not the functions, then change the title. It truly is that simple. However, not for Greer. Because in the following paragraph, Greer writes, But what about those who don't? What about those who don't comply? What about those who don't change the name of the title and change the job description or whatever? Anyone with any experience in ministry understands that institutions like local churches are complicated things and don't always change that easily. And sometimes our arguments are not as persuasive to others as they are to us. Thus, the important question is, what will we do if they don't conform? If we ratify this amendment, we have decided a priori that they are not in friendly cooperation and the credentials committee will have no choice but to recommend disfellowship. Then disfellowship the offending church. If they do not conform to biblical standards, as outlined in the law amendment, then goodbye. Either you courageously stick to the scriptures, or you fold and you continue to drift left towards progressivism. It's a, it's a simple matter with a simple solution, simple at least in theory. Now, is it going to be emotional? Are there going to be emotions involved? Is it going to be difficult? Could it be potentially ugly and stressful and tough yes it could be but that's what the members of the credential committee signed up for that's what leadership in the sbc signed up for and that's what these churches are asking for if they refuse to follow what the sbc has to say regarding women pastors and more importantly what the scriptures have to say regarding female pastors it's time to have a spine if you're not going to have the standard then don't even bother just get rid of the law amendment if you're going to end up folding and continuing to drift, drift left anyway towards progressivism, then don't even bother with things like the law amendment if you're not going to hold firm to these biblical solutions to your problems. So I just recently finished a book called Ending the Homer Castle, and it 
there's an illustration from this that helps. It's a good comparison to kind of understand what's going on here. So in the book, the author, John Rosamond, lays out the issue that many parents and children have with homework. Children come home, it takes them three hours to finish their homework, not because they actually have three hours worth of homework, but because they're lazy, they're irresponsible, they're fiddling around, they're not doing their work, they're their parents end up hovering over them and telling them what to do and continually pushing and prodding them. And it's this fight every single night and parents and both parents and children are exhausted at this fight. So to end the hassle, Rosamond recommends what he calls the ABCs of homework. So A stands for all by myself, meaning that the child does his homework uh, alone alone all, all by himself he's assuming responsibility to complete his own homework mom and dad aren't hovering over him all by himself and then b is back off meaning you the parents don't help him with homework if he if he needs help because he's legitimately reached the end of his rope because he's tried everything or he's completed his homework and he wants somebody to check his work then that's fine but otherwise give him a space in his room his own desk, a quiet spot to work, back off and don't help him. And then the C is call it quits, which means you set an end time for homework. So for instance, if it's eight o'clock, homework's done at eight o'clock. It doesn't matter if you're not finished at eight o'clock, you're done. That way your children are not only getting enough sleep, but they're also learning the valuable skill of time management. And no matter how much they whine or complain or threaten Oh, I'm going to fail my class. You're going to make me fail my class. I'm going to have to repeat the grade. All my friends are going to make fun of me. My teacher's going to fail me. I'm going to run away from home. It doesn't matter. Parents stick to their guns because this is what's best for children. They need to be responsible for getting their homework done. Similarly, stick to the scriptures, SBC. When it comes to women pastors and the law amendment, do not bend. No matter how much whining and complaining you get from white liberals, some blacks and some women, no matter how much these groups throw fits about this, even if they're nuanced and winsome fits, stick to the scriptures. Just like parents need to stick to the homework ABCs so that the homework hassle ends and students take responsibility for getting their schoolwork done and for their academic success. Likewise, the SBC needs to stick to the scriptures no matter how much whining and pushback they get from people who want to do the unbiblical thing. All right, let's continue on in the article. All right, so Greer, hold on a second. Greer goes on to write, put another way, the problem with this amendment is not that it gives churches no space to change their nomenclature. The problem is what it mandates that we do if they don't. Complementarian churches with inaccurate titling for some of their women in ministry are put into the same category as those harboring known sex abusers or marrying gay couples. So if by the same category, Greer means the category of going against the holy word of God, then yes, they are in the same category. You can't be afraid to say that harboring a known sex abuser, marrying a gay couple, and ordaining women as pastors and elders or hiring them as pastors and elders is unbiblical. This whole argument about, oh, it's a nomenclature thing, yes, they are in the same category. Perhaps we would rightfully say in certain circumstances that a sex abuser or marrying a gay couple is more egregious perhaps than having a, a lady pastor in your church, although I'm sure some people would be more than willing to argue they're at least as bad for various reasons. But nonetheless, if they're against the word of God, if they're violations of God's word and the authority of his standard, then yes, they are in the same category. Don't fall for this. This is a scare tactic. Don't fall for this scare tactic. Or maybe it would be more accurate to call it a shame tactic. Either way, don't fall for it. J.D. Greer is just trying to scare you into thinking that you're going to lump sex abusers in with lady pastors. He's trying to shame you into lumping sex abusers with lady pastors. Don't fall for it. It's a weak, snivelingly spineless move, and don't fall for it. 
Greer then goes on to say, that doesn't feel right. This whole idea of lumping sex abusers, lady pastors, and those who marry gay couples together, that doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right because this level of enforced stricture has never been true of our rules of cooperation. Well, forgive me for channel channeling my inner Ben Shapiro, but biblical truth doesn't care about your feelings, JD. It doesn't matter if you have an icky feeling down in your tummy about this. The problem is not with biblical applications like the law amendment. The problem is with your feelings, JD Greer. They don't line up with God's feelings. Your feelings are irrelevant. Let me explain it to you like this. I was thinking about this earlier. When I first really started studying the Canaanite genocide, or it's actually what's called the so-called Canaanite genocide, the conquest of Canaan, didn't like it, didn't feel good about it, didn't feel good that God said, kill everyone, including the women and children, which would include nursing babes and infants. Didn't like that at all. But it didn't really matter what my feelings were. It didn't matter that I didn't like it. What matters is that a holy God is just, righteous, and good always. And that he declared the time for Canaan to repent to be up. And that it was time for judgment to be executed upon the inhabitants of Canaan. And that included the death of their women and their children. And God's hand of vengeance was his people, Israel. It didn't matter that I didn't like it. It's God's perfect justice being executed on those people, and I needed to get over it. And likewise, J.D. Greer needs to get over it. And here's what J.D. Greer says next. In fact, I'd suggest that for those to whom it does feel right, perhaps they are the ones who aren't closely identified with us. So, for those of you, and I would put myself in this category as well, even though I'm not a Southern Baptist, I'm a Reformed Presbyterian, part of the CREC denomination. Nonetheless, those of us who feel it's right, who feel that the law amendment is right, who don't have any problem, who don't have an icky feeling in their stomach about lady pastors being grouped together with those who marry homosexuals and sex abusers, because all three of those things are unbiblical, those of us to whom it does feel right, we're the, we're the problem. We're the ones who aren't closely identified with the Southern Baptist Convention. They're the others. You're the others. So I don't know what to tell you, Southern Baptists. Those of you who support the law amendment as you should. Those of you who think J.D. Greer is an apologist for liberals as you should. You're the problem. J.D. Greer just said, you are the problem. You are the one who don't closely identify with us, with us SBC elites. It's you, you people who steadfastly hold to the scriptures, you people who don't sway in the wind just because a minority or a woman is offended, you're the problem. I'm not saying you should abandon your convention, Southern Baptist, but just know that's what J.D. Greer and people like him think of you. They hate you. You, you disgust them. Just know that that's the case. All right, let us move on in the article. So, J.D. Greer writes next, Some advocates of the amendment have gone on record indicating that they would go further than only excluding churches with the woman on staff called pastor. They believe this amendment authorizes them to suss out churches who have women operating under different titles, director, minister, HR representative, but are still exercising improper, imp improper in their view, authority over men. Sorry, I couldn't read improper in their view in a real voice because it's just so pathetic. All right, back to Greer. Personally, I'm horrified at the idea of a committee making an inquiry of our church to decide if we have women acting in ways that's deem that they deem improper. No, thank you. All right. Since earlier in the article, Greer mentioned the SBC's recent moves within the last few years to police churches that they deem are racist or who harbor sex abusers, I have some questions. I have some questions in light of J.D. Greer being horrified at the idea of a committee making an inquiry into his church to decide 
if they have women acting in ways that they deem improper. I have some questions about that. Would J.D. be horrified at the idea of a committee making an inquiry of his church to decide if his church had people acting racist in ways the committee deems improper? Would that bother Greer? Would he be horrified? <coughs> Excuse me. Would he be horrified at the idea of a committee making an inquiry of his church to decide if his church had people improperly harboring sex abusers according to the committee's definition of improper? Would any of that bother J.D. Greer? Or was J.D. Greer completely on board with the Me Too, Me Too Church 2 movement? Was J.D. Greer completely on board with the anti-racist ways of sniffing out racists within the SBC? Was he totally on board with that? Had no problem with the committee doing things like that. Yet, when it comes to lady pastors, and because this issue upsets women and blacks, now all of a sudden he has a problem with committees making inquiries of churches such as his own. So in between my final preparations for this video and filming it, I, I thought of something. So this situation closely parallels this issue when it comes to looking for racists in the SBC and looking for sex abusers in the SBC. So J.D. Greer does not like the law amendment, does not like the fact that there is going to be these sorts of inquiries made. He doesn't. He thinks that the amendment goes too far, that it takes away church's autonomy, and that it's not the right way to go about things. This is exactly, almost exactly the exact, how many times can I say exactly? This is very similar to what people were saying, people who opposed the anti-racist moves of the SBC and the allegedly Me Too, Church Too moves of the SBC. This is the very, this is very similar to what those people were saying who rightfully opposed the SBC's anti-racist and Church Too push movements and pushes. Because what those people were saying was, look, anti-racism is unbiblical. This is not a way to say, sniff out racist. Can you define racist? What would determine whether or not a church or a member was acting in a racist way or saying something that was racist? If somebody such as myself says, who cares that 4,000 black churches are upset that they can't have lady pastors? Would that be considered racist? And same thing with the church too movement. So I think it was what, Guidepost Solutions, whom the SBC hired to take a look and investigate cases of sexual abuse within the SBC, a company that has affinities for the LGBTQ plus movement. They're pro-tranny and pro-homosexual. They're the ones that the SBC hired to do this, and people rightfully said, what are you doing? Slow down. This is not the right way to go about dealing with sexual abuse. A lot of you know, Title IX style courts and Title IX style actions were set up when Title IX on college campuses, which is basically you're guilty until proven innocent and the whole believe all women motif and theme. People were saying rightfully that you need to slow down on that, because these things were unbiblical, the way the SBC was going about dealing with these issues of racism and sexual abuse. So J.D. Greer now is saying the exact same thing, only about lady pastors. Slow down. There's going to be ramifications. The difference is, well, first of all, Greer, I hope you don't expect people to listen to you when you, when you and your ilk didn't listen to them back then. But the difference is, is that the law amendment's biblical. It's thoroughly rooted in the scriptures. So the issue here is an issue with what the scriptures have to say. Now, Greer and elites like him aren't going to come out and say that. They're going to say things like, well, what about the blacks? Well, what about the women? Well, what about nomenclature? That's how they're going to couch it. The racist and the sexual abuse stuff, that was unbiblical and used unbiblical means to get at the problem where you have the law amendment using biblical means to get at a problem. The elites love the two things where biblical means were not used and they seem to hate this where biblical means are being used isn't that interesting i mean greer helped set up this whole kangaroo court system for sniffing out so-called racists and sex abusers and now he doesn't like it when that same system goes after women pastors all right let's move on in the article 
So Greer goes on and writes, based on what we have seen of the credentials committee, I hope that they would not go down that road, that road of deciding, you know, the thing that horrified Greer, deciding if his church was having women act in an improper way. So based on what we've seen in the credentials committee, I hope that they would not go down that road. But if the amendment passes, I don't see how they couldn't. And even if they resist, we are placing a huge burden on a committee of nine volunteers who are already overwhelmed by a backlog of submissions. They are responsible to process and respond to every one of them. If this passes, they will likely be inundated with mass submissions from those who are determined to police various churches according to their own interpretation of how that church should apply complementarianism. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember Greer sympathizing with the credentials committee or anyone else being overwhelmed with submissions about racists and sex abusers within the SBC. I'm sure Greer saw their burden in those cases as noble and necessary. When confronting the alleged issues of racism and sex abuse, um, the... What do I want to say here? Sorry. Let me think here and catch, catch my thoughts. So when the SBC confronted the alleged issues of racism and sex abuse, that allowed the SBC to appear as anti-racist freedom fighters and valiant supporters of abused women. And no one felt sorry for those who were responsible for looking into the allegations. Now that it's an issue that upsets certain blacks and women and white liberals within the SBC, all of a sudden we should feel sorry for the committee. Now that it is an issue with icky optics, now that it is an issue that J.D. Greer doesn't feel good about, J.D. Greer needs to pen a 3,000-word blog article as a, an apologetic against the law amendment. And that's all from this that I'm going to end up reading. There's a section where Greer goes on to compare himself and some former SBC presidents and other SBC elites. This laughable section at the end of his article where he compares them to the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 saying that him and these men are having their own Acts 15 moment. So in Acts 15, you have the apostles meeting in Jerusalem and determining, okay, are the Gentiles part of the church now? Okay, yes. What do we say to them? We have some members of the circumcision party saying they need to be circumcised. Which parts of Moses' law do they actually need to keep? It was this central issue to the early church about the gospel, the inclusion of the Gentiles, and what laws they should be following and maintaining. What sort of instructions do we give these new Christians in this expanding and ever-growing church? And J.D. Greer says, dealing with the law amendment is their Acts 15 moment. It's a laughable, laughable comparison. Uh, here are my final thoughts. Uh, one thing that I found interesting, uh, J.D. Greer links to the National African American Fellowship letter, not once, not twice, but three times in this article. This shows where at least some of his fear lies. He kept saying... Look, Look what the blacks are saying. Look what the blacks are saying. Look what the blacks are saying. He wants to kowtow. He wants to kowtow to the minority presence in the SBC because the optics would be bad if he didn't. Well, the optics with people who don't matter would be bad. The optics with people who do matter would be really good. They would pat J.D. Greer on the back for being courageous. Uh, when prepping this episode and doing some uh, research into it, I saw that Elevation Church, I didn't know that Elevation Church was a part of the SBC, but they left the SBC due to the law amendment. So this is Stephen Furtick's church, and his wife's on staff there as a pastor, and she's preached a bunch of sermons. Look, losing Elevation was a freebie. Elevation is a train wreck. Stephen Furtick's theology is wretched. His teaching is wretched. And if you want a closer look into that, I recommend the YouTube channel Fight for Truth. Uh, Colin over at Fight for Truth has done an excellent job covering the many, many heresies of Stephen Furtick and Elevation Church. So the SBC, they've been, win they've been winning lately. They've been winning in a, in a couple of ways. Getting rid of Rick Warren, passing the law amendment. Hopefully they continue to do so. And the question is, will the SBC follow the lead of men like Greer, 
and turn back into losers? Or will they hold the line and disfellowship churches that refuse to comply with biblical standards and the standards of the SBC's constitution and the Baptist faith and message? Time will tell. We will see what the fallout from all of this drama is going to be. Well, thank you all so very much for swinging by and listening to today's episode. Hope you found it uh, helpful. We'll catch you next time. God bless.